Welcome to the Pinstripers Podcast, a podcast about pinstripers hosted by two pinstripers. I'm Jack Fleming. And I am Freddie Villa. And today we are going to be interviewing the great Steve Chiseka. Yeah, I, I don't know if you're pronouncing it right, but hopefully <laughs> that's how I would pronounce it. Me neither. You know, we probably should ask him at some point, but anywho. <laughs> we should. <laughs> we probably should have before we interviewed him. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, oh, I'll go ahead. Many of you uh, might have heard of him. If, if you're listening to this podcast, we assume that you're probably pinstripers. He has been very prolific in sharing information and helping a lot of other people learn. He has hosted classes for quite a while, um, and he has his graphics academy right now that I know a lot of people are attending. And during the interview, uh, we'll talk about that just a little bit. He'll kind of have a plug for it. Yeah, Steve's a Steve's a, a prolific pinstriper out of the Ohio area. Uh, I think uh, Middletown, Middletown or Middleton, Ohio. Uh, I think it was Middleton. Middleton. I don't know. I don't have it up right now. But uh, been pinstriping for many many years, um, and has some uh, signature brushes that are developed, and I believe he also has a signature signature brush that's coming out soon or is already out at the moment. So. Uh, that's something that you can look out for. Um, we'll try to put some information out on his uh, social media stuff and where you can maybe contact him. And we do have this podcast should be coming out on all major streaming platforms. Uh, yes, soon. I know right now it is on iHeartRadio, um, or at Stitcher, uh, Spotify. I think that's the three that it's on at the moment. Three major ones. Yeah, we're working on Pandora, and I, I can't think of any other ones currently. But Apple, Apple, hopefully, yeah, Apple Podcast. So we're working on it. Uh, we're trying to get our we're trying to get our ducks in a row, folks. So please bear with us, and we appreciate everybody listening. Um, and oh man, big big thank you, to everyone who's listened so far. There's been quite a few, and all the feedback that we've gotten back from people, we really really appreciate. I know at the end of this, we'll probably say it again but if you guys have things that you specifically want to know people you want us to interview questions that you might would have let us know um i'll give you some information at the end of this too about where you can send us those questions and maybe it's time we should go ahead and get on with the interview all right folks without further ado here is steve chaseka jack and i Good morning. Good morning, Steve. Yes, sir. All right. We're on the podcast now. I'm going to try to connect Jack. Give me one second. All right. All right, Jack, you there? I am here. All right, Steve, morning. can you hear Jack? Yeah, good morning, Jack. Good morning. I can hear you good. Great. Great. Good to see everybody. Yeah, welcome, welcome. Good. Uh, I'm glad that the three way calls still exist in the year 2022. <laughs> yeah, kind of a interesting setup, huh? Well, you know, we're trying to reach out to uh, all over the U.S. and maybe who knows international. But again, we were we didn't want to um, impede anybody with technical crap. You know, especially us, because mm -hmm. <laughs> we're, we're, yeah. not, we're not that good at it. So we're just trying. <laughs> huh, okay, I understand. 72 years old, I get it completely. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, um, uh, welcome to the podcast. We're excited to have you on. Uh, Steve Chaseka, where, uh, whereabouts are you located at right now? Uh, northeastern Ohio, a little town called New Middletown, uh, kind of dead center between cleveland and pittsburgh up in that neck of the woods all right and have you always been uh located around that area or are you from originally from somewhere else no i grew up here a little farm about two minutes from where i live now and uh i always like the area you know you gotta live somewhere so i like farmland and quiet and peace and uh know my neighbors and they know me and uh you know, our little town has one red light very rural we just got the red light. In fact, several years ago, it was, it was a big deal. You know, we set up our lawn chairs and watched the light change. So it's pretty fun. 
Well, that's... about how big do you think the population there is? I'm curious. <laughs> Oh, it's just a few thousand. I mean, it's just, like I said, it's really a tiny little place to live and a uh, uh, nice place to grow up, like a Norman Rockwell painting, you know? Yeah. I uh, I remember whenever we came out there and visited you, I was blown away with how pretty it is. Yeah, it's really quiet. And there's nobody, I, you know, I can look outside and see cornfields and trees and I, school right next door. So it's uh, just a nice little place to grow up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Jack and I kind of got not lost, but I missed a couple of exits while talking to him. Mm-hmm. So we got to see a little bit more of uh, the countryside than we expected. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's where I used to ride my bicycle and and uh, jog when I was jogging, you know, and uh, a lot of nice back roads and country folk around here. Well, nice. Well, um, so, uh, pinstriping, uh, where, where do you suppose that got started on, on, uh, in the history of, uh, of your pinstriping? Like, where did you first see it at? Well, there's a little body shop about a mile from me and, uh, I never knew anything about pinstriping. I, I liked art. I was always drawing ever since I was little and, uh, loved art. One of the find a way to make a living doing art and one day i stumbled across a oh probably a 73 dodge van it was marooned in color and the local striper guy shively had put some squiggles on the glass of all things with a brush and i just boy i looked at that line and i thought what the heck is that and i was curious and i asked the guy that ran the body shop you know how how what do you know about that he goes i don't know i got this little brush he dragged out this old uh, green wrap Mac brush that was he used to touch up lacquer, you know, when they were using lacquer and they would use it to touch up scratches on a car. It was all dry and crooked and she was here to try. <laughs> so, you know, I grabbed the brush and a can of lacquer and started making a mess and uh, soon found out that it wasn't something you just, you know, jump into. But I, I couldn't resist the beauty of it you know and so i kept on and started looking into it a little more and more and uh it just was a real struggle to find any information at all about it because there was no you know a guy wouldn't show me anything back then you know everything was secret so hush hush so i went to his shop actually and asked him if he would teach me how to do it and he actually turned his back and hid the brush and said no i i'm, I'm not teaching anybody you know and, I thought, boy, you just you just made the wrong guy mad. <laughs> I'm going to learn this on my own, whether you like it or not. You know. So, how old were you then? Uh, 24, 25. Okay. And then it was a matter of uh, dogged determination. You know, I, everybody that does this, everybody that I've ever talked to, it's like a religious experience. You get the calling. You know, when you see, it, you go, "Oh, that's for me." You know. Something changes in your mind, and you just go after it. So that's what I did. I just kind of went after it, and slowly, I mean, gradually, got a little better. But there, but there were no classes, no YouTube, no Facebook, no media, nothing. Little one-inch square pictures in Hot Rod magazine. You could kind of see what people were doing, and it took. It kind of started from there, all those years ago. And and at the time. Um how, what you were using the what the the green wraps is that what you and, and where did you come across actually getting some supplies at those times well there was a local there was a store that uh sold automotive supplies and i picked up some green wraps there and that's how i started and then as i learned a little bit about control First thing I wanted to do, go out and make money doing it, you know. So I went out and hacked up a few jobs. I mean, nice. It was, it looked like, I always use the phrase, looked like they used the Q tip and a bottle of nail polish, you know. It was just yeah. awful, just horrible. But like a lot of new guys, you know, I thought I had arrived. I thought, oh, I'm a pinstriper now, so here we go. And then I came home and I started doing my cabinets in the house and the dishwasher and the washing machine. And my wife says, get out of here, go build a shop. So I built a shop next door to my house probably within five years of when I started and moved all my junk over here at the shop. And I'm still here, same place. But uh, it was like, you know, when a farmer clears a field, 
you got to take all the trees out, dig the roots out, plow it, plant it. it takes years. And, you know, and that's what this was like for me, the struggle. But, you know, I just never gave up. And uh, got a little better and a little better. And then, uh, you know, just slow going, like, you know, pushing a car to get it started. It was like, come on already. And now things are so different. It's so completely different. You you can you can attest to that. Yeah, the information is readily available. I mean, I didn't have to, uh, I didn't have to really speak to anybody. I was kind of just watching, you know, your short clips that you had on YouTube, and then uh, finding the people like on Pinstripers Garage to give me, you know, any answer I wanted. So I, I sure. definitely did have a, a easy leg up on that. I, I'm unsure. I think Jack started earlier before the social media stuff. Uh, is that right, Jack? Yeah, I started in early 2000s the first time. I mean, I took a big break from it. <laughs> Did you? But uh, it was it was pretty similar then when I came back to it. Now, I know I've said this on here before. You know, it was a completely different world. I mean, there was information everywhere. Whereas before that, I didn't find information where I was in slightly rural Mississippi at the time. I didn't find much. Sure. And that's, and that's okay. You know, the medical field, the science field, everything has been advanced because of the ready, the ready, readily available help that people are willing to give. And uh, so that's a good thing for us because, you know, I, I don't know how many times I've heard people say, oh, this is a dying art. This art is flourishing now more than it did ever in history, in my opinion. I, I could agree with that. Uh, finding a marketplace is is the trick but um that, you know that's a whole other topic but to, to to learn the skill now is not easy the same struggle i had to go through but at least there's people to get you over those like myself and the classes and stuff it's, it's easy to get over some of the humps if someone shows you how yeah. you know the little nuances of handling the brush and loading the brush and where to put the lines and color you know, there's so much to it a lot to it and, and you know go ahead, oh. go ahead jack yeah, I, I'd like to jump in real quick on that because, you know, I, I mentioned that I started kind of on my own early 2000s and, and took a break because of life. You know, I ended mm -hmm. up going into a different career. I taught art. And when I came back to it, because I just, I don't know, I guess I kind of felt empty without it. You know, all of a sudden there's all these resources and Facebook and stuff like that existed. And I had come across the site that was there and, I thought it was amazing because people were extremely helpful. And the reason that I mentioned this is you were one of the first people to jump in there and be real supportive and helpful. And I've, I've seen you and, and a handful of other people do that with just everybody, it seems like. And I, I'm thankful for that. And I'm sure a lot of other people are thankful for all that. It seems like you've been doing to spread the information, I guess, education, all of that. <laughs> Well, in response to that, I'd like to say that uh, it was probably because of that initial shock I had when my friend, now we're friends, we're good friends now, Guy and I, but uh, when the, the initial shock I had when he wouldn't help me, and I thought that's so unfair and so uh, un, unfeeling and you just won't let me hang out here to wither on the vine and die. <laughs> and I know, I know that there's other people like me out there that are going to stop at nothing. And I've, I've experience that you know people want to learn bad enough they're gonna they're gonna dig and scratch and push you know like a football player running down the field they'll push anything out of the way that's in their path to get where they're going and you can't stop that so there's no point in trying to uh sequester someone who's um ambitious they're going to find a way to do it so the best thing to do is is uh talented people like your both of you is to say here, you're not going to hurt me by learning how to do this. I don't care if you're 10 miles away. I have my customers. They're going to come to me. You'll develop some customers. They'll come to you. We'll grow. We'll grow the marketplace. We're not going to steal from each other and make us each other hurt. We're going to grow it because you'll get more customers. I'll get. They'll tell their friends and they'll check me out. So I might check you out. It's going to help it. And it's, it's, that's the way it's been, really. You know, it's grown. And do you suppose at some point you had some folks that helped you along the way early on or middle middle of the way through? Was there, was there some people that were able to guide you on some stuff like that? 
Uh, no, <laughs> in a word, <laughs> no, uh, no, I, I really kind of led the charge as far as uh, breaking down some of those barriers. And the first time, now there were people doing what I did. I'm, I can't really claim ownership of the helping thing, but, you know, there were groups of people that were meeting other places along the way also, but it, it really exploded with the advent of pinheads and uh, people got together specifically to uh, and advance the art form, and uh, that was a big step for everybody. And that- Would you mind explaining to, I guess, the people that are listening what Pinheads is in case they don't know? Um, it's not a controversy to me, but some people say, oh, sure, you started Pinheads, Steve. Back in uh, 92, 93, I went to a Letterheads meet. And I was bored out of my mind because, you know, I had all this ambition and spark of creativity to bring to the table. And they were all talking about vinyl and squeegees and transfer tape. And I'm like, hey, boy, this is not where I need to be. So I wandered off to the back of the building. And there was an overhang on the back of this building up in Indiana. I think Gary, I forget his last name, uh, started that, had that, hosted that letterheads meet. There was like 13, 14 stripers back there. Donnie Edwards, Tiny and Slick. And guys I'd heard of and they're all back there tagging each other's brush box and painting the rental cars and any bikes that came in a letter and trucks in the back. And I'm like, yeah, this is where I belong. So I just went <laughs> right in, you know, sat there and we, we, we just had a blast. And upon arriving home, <clears throat> I thought, you know, pinstripers need that kind of venue, not for lettering, but for pinstriping. So I thought, well, letterheads is a cool name. How about pinheads? So I called John from uh, signs of the times. I said, what do you think about this name Pinheads? You know, I mean, it's a cool idea. I think we'd all benefit. He said, hey, run it up the he says, run it up the flagpole and see if anybody salutes, you know. So I put an ad in the in the magazine, first annual Pinhead Summit and Panel Jam. And uh well, like 50 guys show up here. You know, I had at no your clue. place. Yeah. And we 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 charged a hundred bucks or sixty bucks at the time, whatever it was. Three days, we had food, music, you know, panels to work on, easel set up. It was a pretty big deal. Good Lord. You know, Alan Johnson was here and Tramp and guys that, you know, Weisgerber shows up. All these names of guys like, oh, man, I never knew heard of half of them. And it was so cool. We did like 2 o'clock in the morning every night. We were just loving each other, having a blast. So that's where it started. In fact, I've been standing in the room where it started. and. Uh, there it is. It's a, it's an international thing now, you know, and I don't take a bow or take credit and you know, tell everybody, hey, that's my idea. It, but it was. It, it started here based on what what it is today. It, it's still based on the camaraderie. And you guys have been there. These guys have such respect and admiration for each other. And you learn a ton, a ton. And that no other trade does that. No other art form does that. You don't see oil painters, you know, having oil heads <laughs> whatever they whatever they would call it. but pinstripers are a pretty cool group when they get together really you have to admit that right yeah yes. yeah well <laughs> for me when when i first got to you know was able to conversate with folks online i thought these are these are living legends these are people that have that have made a name for themselves uh, over the years and it's like it's like a ball player, like a regular kid being able to speak to a Jordan or a, or a Magic Johnson or, you know, uh, uh, professionals that have, that have been at it and that are still at the top of the game. So I thought that was real interesting how accessible uh, and kind uh, everybody's been basically from the get-go, for, at least to us. Now, I understand that was a different story on your end, too, so that's... It's unfortunate, well, and, but that's probably where you know where we're we're getting the the better end now with you guys. Well, I I, I respond to that sometimes because it sounds like uh, flattery, and, and it's often hard to take a compliment of that magnitude because of the humility that most of us have. Is that um, I remember telling that to a fine artist. In fact, a buddy of mine, <clears throat> fine artist here in town, I was I was googling over him like, oh my god, you're in the you're in the museum, you're you're this. He said, try that on somebody else. You know, I'm just a guy <laughs> like you. I happen to have talent. I happen to have a, li- a, li- a uh, library of of uh, work. Quietly going about my day, doing my st- my thing. And yeah, you know, I like attaboys and and accolades and ink and press and all that stuff. But by and large, I still drive a used car and live in an older house. And it's the love of the craft. 
that drives the the my, me anyway. And, and there's a few guys with big egos, but most of us, most of the guys that have been at it a long time, are like that. They're helpful. They're happy to <clears throat> have risen to this level. But the the most exciting thing to me is seeing guys like you guys that are 30, 40 years younger and hot rod Jen and, and I can name a, a hundred people, you know, Kirk and that are just absolutely light years ahead of where I was at their age because of what us guys share. So it's, it's just satisfying. It's gratifying, you know? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> And over the years, you've been able to develop some uh, brushes with, uh, with I think, Mac Company as well? Yeah, you know how that works. The same as it worked with Airbrush Action Magazine. You know, these companies and manufacturers see guys like us and they go, hey, there's a, there's a free ride. If I slap Steve's name on a brush, <laughs> I make more money. Uh, if I if I let Steve write for my magazine, he, his ego gets uh, folded to the top with ink, and we make a ton of money. You don't make any money on. I mean, I make a couple bucks a brush. I'm happy to do it for for Chris. He and I are good friends. But uh, and I'm not saying that to be cynical. <clears throat> That's how the world works. Yeah. If you if you if you come with talent, and someone sees the ability to showcase you, first of all, which helps your brand which is what I gained from Airbrush Action. Uh, it built a name and a reputation. It showcased what I could do. Others recognize my name now, but that, that, that didn't put a dime on my table. You know, it, didn't, it didn't pay the bills. But what it did was gave me the confidence and the, and the uh, spotlight that if I want to go somewhere and teach, they rec- it's not like, who's this? They're like, oh, Steve's coming. He's going to show us how to do that. So it works both ways. You know, there, there's a, there's an end game for both of us. He sells a lot of magazines. I go places and I'm recognized because of that. So, and the confidence, the, the, the biggest thing to me is the confidence of uh, having accomplished uh, and being recognized for all that hard work. You guys know. <laughs> And nobody handed you this this skill set. You you did it yourself. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's uh, like I when we were talking to uh, Craig Judd. It's a lot of time by yourself. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot of alone time, and just trying to get that line better, trying to make a cooler design, or you know, just trying to perfect what you do. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it is it is nice to uh, yeah to be to be known sort of for for your talents uh i recall when i started the youtube channel people thought i was putting down vinyl they thought that my designs were vinyl and this was very early you know early on um (laughs) so i did the little i started the little channel just to show my friends hey look i'm doing this with a brush you know and then yeah it sort of snowballed into the you know it's now i got some 300 some odd videos but uh it's still fun and I, I'm, I'm able to also uh help some folks out and it's kind of led to us talking now you know sure and, and 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 what's nice is that exposure there's there's people out there um i've got a son-in-law who you'll never know who he is you'll never see him on social media his personality is uh he, he's very not secretive but he's very to himself a respectful guy nicest guy ever wanted me but he's just not into the social media thing um <clears throat> and there's a lot of guys like him out there that are so good he's he lives two miles down the road from me has a shop used to work for me and just a phenom and there's so many guys like that out there that one of the precepts i put out there when i first did pinheads was when i gave a little i can remember standing up behind a podium and telling all these guys how he was here and Oh, Bill Ride, all these big name guys. And I said, listen, I don't know who all of you are, but let's do, let's keep one thing in mind. When you walked in that door, I hope you hung your ego on that nail because this is no place to be flashing your egos. There's people here twice as good as you, probably. So let's learn from each other and let's be humble. And that was the basis of, we're going to have a good time, but uh, if you don't pick up a brush and help, and show what you have, you're not going to be invited back. That was that was a requirement. You have to share what you know if you're coming here. Other places you can go and look over somebody's shoulder, 
And there was a guy here uh, one time that uh, walked around with his hands in his pocket, was just like camera, you know, picking up ideas and didn't pick up a brush. And I said, come on, man, grab a, grab a brush. And he wouldn't do it. So we kind of kicked him out. <laughs> you know, this is about, <laughs> we're not here to be a one-way street. You have to give something back. So, but yeah, the, 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 uh, the whole tr- trip of getting that recognition and being uh, known for this crazy thing called pinstriping is fun and it's it's like unlike i don't know <clears throat> i've done all kind of art in my life but the cool I, I tell my students when they come to my courses or take my online school i say I, i'm the most uncool guy i know but and you probably are too but when you pick up that brush and start working on somebody's car or bike and they start showering you with this coolness like man you are oh man i can't believe you're so cool look what you can do that feels good you know i feel cool for a while yeah. <laughs> you know so i'm the biggest doofus i know as far as that goes but <laughs> when i'm laying down lines you know and people are uh, falling over head over heels it's like this feels good i'm like i like these compliments i like these that's half the half the fun for me the money is secondary you know there's a big satisfaction to that absolutely and and um how how far into your uh pinstriping before you started going to rallies and doing shows and such <clears throat> well probably about 10 years too soon i was into it for about 20 years and I had a good job as an artist. I was working as an artist in a, uh, a mail order company, and uh, I was doing this on the side in the weekends. I, used to, I always remember I was making as much on a Saturday and Sunday at a rally as I did all month with this <laughs> art job. And I could do that three times a month, four times a month in the summer. So I was making my entire salary in like 50 days in the summer that I was making all year with this guy. So I'd been into about 15, 20 years, maybe. And I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go full time. And I took the leap. My wife was like, are you sure? <laughs> so look what we're doing. Look what we're doing in, in two days a week. Imagine if I had six more days or five more days a week to work. What if I did this 40 hours? And that's what kind of kicked it off. And we only struggled for maybe two or three years during uh, the Reagan years. I don't know what happened. The economy went south, but uh, we always had, you know, sufficient income to to live on, and it was it was pretty lucrative, you know. So it was ambition and talent and and a business acumen. Not everybody knows how to run a business. So, matter of fact, I just put a. Uh, <clears throat> A lecture on my school, my uh, Steve Shazaka Graphics Academy, if I can sort of plug there, called Taking It to the Streets. And the premise of that is, okay, Hotshot, now you know how to pinstripe. What are you going to do with it? You know, we trained you. You're, you're good. How are you going to make money? And, and guys will shrug and go, I don't know. Let's go out there and put a sign up, I guess. There's a lot to it. So I talk about my experience of methods of gaining a customer base and there's people around here doing it for years so how do i get their customers into my shop how do i get my customers into my shop how do i uh, develop a groundswell of support by just by, by being good but there's other way you have to go out and do stuff and i tell i'll tell people what i did and if you want to try those methods work for me you know, not just it's not just talent. There's people out there less talented. There's people out there more talented. But I sh- I I kind of approach this with the idea of full time, two hundred, three hundred an hour when you're working, and and go for it at that at that level. So if you want to go out and uh, be the cheapest guy in town, I tell you the, the pitfalls of that, and it's a it's a pendulum. You know, you can try to keep it level, but it's hard to develop a business without knowing how to how to proceed so i kind of i kind of lean into the income end of it in my training because you you, you're putting in the hours you know like those like a craig said you know a lot of loan time well it's it's time to charge for that send a collect on it go into college and you go to college for four years you jump out and start a business you remember those four years when you start (laughs) giving your prices out so that's what this is like for me is yeah, it's great to be 
the cool guy and <clears throat> have cool cars parked in your drive every day and people want to come and hang out with you because you're the pinstriper in town but it's a business you know it's but, not like a not a hobby the uh, taking it to the street still is that a class then that's part of your academy it's a it's a lecture it's an hour okay. and there's going to be a second hour coming up soon and it's basically uh that it's it's the it's the uh it's a one-on-one i'm just sitting there talking i'm not painting while i'm doing i'm just talking about how i develop my my field and my business and my training and my customer base and i've lost a few i talk about my failures as well as my successes so and is that uh is that a live thing then or is it it's it's recorded the the school the school is downloadable you you go to my website or my uh facebook page steve shizeka graphics academy and you click on the school and you look at the courses that are available and then uh, all the train the courses are you know, you download them and you don't download them. You watch them for uh, or six months for the pinstriping course. But the the lecture is good for those that have taken some courses and they're at that cusp, you know, of, well, you know, I got a guy offering me to stripe a bike. How do I, what do I charge? How do I do this? What, what if he doesn't like it? Do I wipe it off? Do I do it at my shop? Do I go to his? I talk about all that. You know, one of, one of the things I insist <clears throat> when I go to somebody's shop before I even leave the shop, I tell them I charge for travel. You know, if it's over like 20 miles, I ask them what the lighting is like. I tell them when I get there, I want the money on the table when I walk in the door, not when I'm done. So I, I set some pretty stiff ground rules because I don't want them saying, well, I don't think I like that. You know, if I have to come to you, I'm completely vulnerable. So, right. And I've had people not pay me. They just disappear. They never come back. I got to go get a beer. I'll be back. And <laughs> you're stuck there with their place. Jeez, man. It's happened a couple of times. So now I'm like, hey, I'll be there at nine o'clock. I need $400 plus tax in my hand when I start just because I don't want to be working with the idea that I hope I get paid. If I'm if I'm comfortable, you're going to get my A game. Just do me that as a courtesy. And it usually works. Um I want the music to be my music. I tell them I'm bringing my boombox and my playlist. So if you don't like well, the music I like, that's fine. I'm, this makes me comfortable. And they, I, but they have the ultimate respect because you're working on their three hundred thousand know, dollar. Yeah, I just did a million dollar uh, twenty one or twenty three Cadillac V sixteen for a guy. And he had me go to a shop. <clears throat> I said, "Yeah, I can. I can do that." Here's the deal. I give him the deal. He he was great. He put six hundred bucks in my hand when I walked in the door, and everything was fine. And we got along well. You know, he'll have me back. So it's kind of like that. You know, I, I, that's just some of the things I talk about. That you can go to places and hate that music. It might be something you hate on the radio. It's distracting. You have to be in your zone to, to do this. You guys know that. And so if they're going to disrupt your flow. You know, you're you just can't deliver. So I kind of set all that up in the in the process, and uh, you know, pricing is a big, big thing. So we talk quite a bit about that. But you know, I want to see guys succeed in this. I don't want them to. I know so many guys that get frustrated. I can't do that. You, how do you make that kind of money? I can't make that kind of money in my town. Yes, you can. Absolutely, you can. So. You know, that's uh, something I find really interesting talking to you. And when we talk to Craig, both of you guys are in pretty small towns um, and then able to to make it work. I'm in a small town and, you know, I'm only three or four years into it. But, yeah, it's building it up over time. But it's really fascinating to me to see that you don't have to be in a big, heavily populated area. Well, don't forget, these people are on wheels to come to you. They go. They'll travel a thousand miles to go see the waterfalls, or a hundred miles, two hundred miles a day in a trip to go visit this or go see this. So they'll come here. I've had people here from Michigan and Louisiana to drive all the way here because they like my work, and that's what that's awesome. You two have that. Not everybody has that. You know, people that are developing, like when I was first starting, don't have the skill set, the, the the chops. But, you know, you watch the musician develop. If, if he's good enough, he's going to get called out by, you know, Stephen Tower. Hey, can you play drums for me? Imagine getting that call. You know, well, that's the same with this in a smaller scale. If you're good enough, 
that guy's going to take that motorcycle out or car out and people are going to look at their striping and then they're going to look at your striping and go, man, who did that? Oh, Jack did that. Really? Where's he at? That's advertising. I build that into every job. So that's how you, that's how I get customers from far away. You deliver the, you deliver the goods, you know, so that's how that works. And just out of curiosity, the, the, uh, and this might be a little bit off topic, but the name, uh, the wizard, where did where did that come about? Well, I, I'd heard some people had these wacky names, you know. And uh, when I was in, uh, just got out of the Navy, and I was going to go to Sarasota. I moved to Sarasota to go to uh, Ringling School of Art, and I didn't get to go. I didn't have the money. But while I was there, uh, the kid I knew in Sarasota was in the Navy with them. And uh, I stayed at his house. He goes, you got to come meet this guy, the wizard. Oh, man, this guy can do anything. This wizard, he can do wiring, body work. He paints cars. He's the wizard. I heard that name. And by the time I got there, I expected this 10-foot tall halo, <laughs> you know, around the guy's head and the cape. And, the, and it was just some dude in the garage, you know, wouldn't talk to us. But he had a reputation. And that name was so glamorous, you know. So, uh when I came home and started my thing, I thought, man, you need a catchy name that, that you can build a reputation around it. So I just stole his name, you know, so <laughs> I thought it was a pretty cool name. It's worked for me, you know, and I dropped it in the last few years. So I don't use it anymore, but people still know me as that, you know, oh, the wizard. And the problem is living up to that name because people think you can do anything. <laughs> You're the wizard, man. You can do that. I, said, I can't do that. I paint the bottom of your swimming pool, paint a mural on your pool. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, it was pretty cool. It was, that's where I got the name, though. Straight up stole it from a guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. And there were other wizards. There's a wizard up in out in Tulsa. There's one up in Canada. Yeah. Pekka over in, in Finland. He has three Zs in his wizard. So, yeah, it's not the only one. Oh, nice. Well, I, you know, I, I, I think everybody considers their name now, maybe not so much. I don't know about back then, but now, you know, you, you hear all these, uh, different names and I went through it and I just couldn't think of nothing. And I think maybe Jack <laughs> is there with me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so he's, yeah. He's Fleming, uh, artistry, right, Jack Fleming artistry. Yeah, it's, I just go by my name. I've used artistry as far as websites and stuff just to kind of sure. yeah, and description I just, of what's going on. And I, I've always had folks, for some odd reason, repeat my last name to me. Like at work, they call me Vila or whatever, Villa or Via, mm-hmm. you know, whichever version they want of it. But it seemed to be catchy on its own for them. So I was like, well, it's easy enough. Plus, I suck at lettering and it's easy for me to sign. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so that Interesting helped. you mentioned that, uh, sucking at lettering, because I was talking last night on my forum that, uh, not all of us do everything and do it well. So, uh, you know, one of the students was asking, how do I get into gold leaf? Well, that's a big topic. We had Paul Quinn on as a guest speaker. And, oh, that'd be you know, I encur- good. Yeah, and I encouraged him. I said, look, you're going to find things that you're good at. One of the students from Washington was on and he said, you know, I'm just having a frustration. I want to do, I want to learn how to do your backgrounds and your wood grain and your chrome and your lettering and your pinstriping and your scroll style. I said, we ain't going to do it in six months or six years. I said, find the one you're best at because he's frustrated. You know, he wants to be the wizard in, in a year. I said, it's not going to happen like that. Pick the thing you're best at and develop it and dabble in the other things. But when, and, and I said, here's how you, here's how you do that. If you find yourself watching TV 10 hours a week, take five of those hours and practice. But wasting time. You have to develop that dedication in your heart. Nobody's going to do it for you. Nobody's going to call you up and say, hey, are you practicing? You got to do it yourself. So just you have to have that drive. And if you don't have it, if you don't have that, you're done. You're, you're going to, you're going to, you will be stuck in that rut and that, and that level of excellence that you've, you've gotten to, but you won't get any better. Until you plow into it and keep going harder and harder. So, you know, the, the, the frustration that you just mentioned about you suck at lettering, you know, I struggle with. I can't pull straight lines on cars. Does that make me not a pinstriper? 
Well, I'll, I'll compare paycheck to paycheck with anybody out there that can pull straight lines because I do other things well, you know. So the bottom line is what counts to me. You know, if, if you want to do cartoons, be the best cartoonist out there. If you want to do gold leaf, take a year or six months. It ain't that hard. Lettering, same thing. Go see Mike Meyer, take a class. If you want to do photo reels, go see Drew Blair. So you want to learn how to pinstripe? Take my course. <laughs> you know, I'll show you how to do it. My method. It may not be the only way, but uh I, I got a question for you. Sure. Kind of based on that. Um you do a lot of airbrush work and stuff too. What came first for you then? Was it striping or airbrush? Striping and then uh the guy that ran that body shop had an old airbrush. I was rooting through his box looking for a a uh a striping brush and I saw the airbrush. He had an old Binks Wren, single action, you know. And I took to that like a duck to water because I could draw. So they both developed about the same time. I've only gotten so far with the airbrush. Uh, I, I, I tell people when I teach it on my course, I just open up my airbrush course, but I say, I'll get you as far as I can go. And then the rest of it's up to Drew Blair. <laughs> to, 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 do you want photorealism? Get get as good as I am, but then goes. Because I took his class and it was over my head. I mean, it was way more technical than I'm comfortable with. So. You know, I don't do. I don't care about photorealism. I want. I want work that bikers like and hot rods like. And uh, you want a portrait? Go see Drew. <laughs> you know? How much of your business, I, I guess, is airbrushing? Probably thirty percent. It's it's a it's an extra hundred dollars an hour for me to pick up an airbrush. So when I'm doing pinstriping, it's around two two fifty an hour. But when I'm doing airbrushing, it's about 350 because it's I'm so fast with it. I can knock out a you know a whole bike, like a three thousand dollar job. I can knock it out in a day. Air, you know, flames and skulls, that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> the speed is what's my asset in airbrushing. But um, I, I only I only do certain things. You know, not great. I'm not like Rand Loker with or my son-in-law with real tight graphics and the, you know the that uh all that stuff i don't get into that i'm I'm like wham bam get it done you know and, every, and uh, people, you know the rallies is where i got fast at it doing bikes on the road so now it's probably i'm retired now sort of but it's probably like 30 percent all along was there a brush pinstriping was a big one for me right and some lettering yeah truck door you know doing truck i always thought that you know when you letter a truck with vinyl even i got a vinyl cutter here my advantage is i'll throw a striping job in for another couple hundred bucks throw a few doodads on it and it gives me an edge but now they're doing that in vinyl too (laughs) so So, but it's been really a lot of fun learning to do the different thing i wish i could do gold better I don't wish I could pull straight lines on cars. That bores the daylights out. But um, yeah, I, I guess kind learn. of backing that up. I've tried my hand at airbrushing, and I just can't get into it. <laughs> really, <laughs> it's just yeah. And then I mean, I paint, I draw, I do stuff that's realistic to where that would probably even be quicker. But I just I, I don't know. There's no passion there for it. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I I always told. I always told Dwayne he would be good at it if he'd pick up an airbrush. He's just like, get out of here. That's his attitude. <laughs> you know, and he would. He'd be killer at it because he's so artistic and motivated. But that's not for everybody, I guess. You know? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, like you said, with, you know, long lines bore you, you got to find what interests you and what, what it is that you have enough drive to pursue to get good at. <clears throat> well, in that regard, you know, talent. The amount of talent you're blessed with, you, know, you didn't you didn't give yourself this talent. You're you're born with it. What you do with it, how you parlay it into income, is up to you. And there's a lot involved there. That's what that course addresses. That taking it to the streets course. A lot involved there because I know artists that are really really good, and they're working somewhere else because that whole dealing with the customer and getting the stroke on the neck, how good you are. Oh, you're the best. They don't get that. And they're mad, you know, because they don't get those. They're not getting what they look for because of their talent. They'll walk away. So I talk about overcoming that and and uh, turning that talent and, and into money. Not everybody has a huge amount of talent. A lot of stripers can only do a dagger style. 
but they're so stinking good at it. You know, they don't do cartoons and caricatures and freehand, but they do striping and they've got a huge business. And that's sufficient. If they love what they're doing, stay there, pal. Don't go get a factory job because you had a couple bummers. Stay with it. It'll, it'll, if you're that good, you'll flourish, not just uh, survive. So it's, it's this balancing act, you know, uh, having some of talent, but what are you going to do with it? You don't want to, you don't want airbrush? Look at your oil painting. I can't do that, you know. Enjoy it. <laughs> you know, yeah. your, embrace it, you know. Yeah, uh, I'm curious to know. Uh, you said dagger style. I've I've heard that uh, term from you a few times, but I'm I'm curious where that term came from. Dagger style. It's not my. Uh, yeah, it's it's a misnomer. Uh, I've had people try to correct me. I wiggle them two fingers on each hand because I used an improper adjective there. I call it the dagger style because of the points on the C curve look like a knife blade. Ah, uh, okay. Like one of those little Arabian swords, you know, they're cool. It's uh, you could call it a sword style or old school, but I just call it that because I like the name, you know. Yeah, it sounds cooler. I mean, a dagger sounds cooler. Yeah, man, that's cool. I'm a dagger guy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it does sound cooler than sword. I mean, I'll be honest. I, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm also curious to know the scrolling style. Like, where that's the first thing to be honest that really caught my eye in pinstriping. It wasn't the the old school or dagger stuff it was the scrolling and it was oh, primarily yeah. your your f- few clips that you had on youtube showing the vortex uh, I, I remember specifically one where at the very end you dropped the thing and you're like oh. yeah. yeah i'm glad that's still up there got a lot of views uh uh i was in a body shop and about 10 miles from here and i was uh lettering a truck for this kid not in his junk he already had for a yard was an old cab of a semi truck that someone had pulled two long lines and at the end of it they had that, that little figure V8 or figure eight scroll. Mm-hmm. I went, what the heck is this now? I'd never seen it. So I had a French master lettering brush and I, I learned how to do that style. And then I got on, you know, and then of course the, inter, uh, the internet came out and uh, I got to start seeing Kafka and all these other scrollers, Jensen. I'm like, man, this this can really turn into something. So. You know, I borrowed and begged and stole from who I could, and I developed my own look. And uh, continuing, you know, uh, there's a guy out west that does it with a, a, a striping brush. Oh, was it uh, Danny A? No, he got a video on there. He turns that thing about 360. And, uh, man, fat lines, you know, like Freddie uses. And I'm trying to incorporate more of that into my style, but, you know, you can... I, I do like everybody else. I have a go-to kind of a, I don't know what do you call it, a few lines I like to do. And I'm comfortable there, and I get a lot of business from doing just that. So I don't want to get lost in somebody else's look. But <laughs> I, I, I love what Freddie did. I love what Jensen did and some of the stuff, some of the stuff Kafka did. I love their stuff. And it just has a, you know, I compare the two styles to, uh, like I compare the da- dagger style to rock and roll, you know, real hard turns, unexpected beats and kicks and, and uh, very few 360s. I compare that to like rock music and I compare the scroll style to like classical ballet, you know, a symphony of just movement and freestyle, everything just smooth and uh, clusters, just beautiful clusters of movement and color. So. You know, the dagger's completely different, and the scroll's completely another uh, train of thought for me. So I don't like to mix them. I don't like the look when they're mixed. And uh, so I just, that's my theory. But uh, yeah, it's been, that scroll style just is gorgeous, ain't it? Yeah, it's, it, to me, that was what blew my mind. And I didn't try. Uh, the regular style of my first attempts were scroll. So yeah, yeah, I was trying to figure out how to mix the paint. Right. And at some point with scrolling, you're going backwards with the brush. Yeah. You're pushing away from yourself without seeing where you're going. Yeah. Your hand covers it up. <laughs> I think that's where people, that's where people get lost. Plus I also noticed you hold the brush up and down almost as if it was a, 
lettering brush, right? Like a, a parallel. Yeah. Right. I wish people could see my hand because I'm literally making the hand you make. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I couldn't quite uh, figure that out, so I had to figure out my own way, and I hold it completely different. I actually grab it by the ferrule. Uh, Ooh. Yeah, right at the – because I got tiny hands. I got little little kid hands. It's weird. <laughs> um, so I, like, have to grab it by the ferrule. At no point does my hand ever touch the actual handle. Right. So I've had to figure out my own way, and I've tried your way. It's just so unnatural. But I guess everybody develops their own way, right? Yeah, that's it. That's exactly it. Uh, uh, this popped into my head. I wanted to say this. There's nothing to do with what we're talking about. But I had a guy tell me one time. I can't remember who it was. But he said, if you're a pinstriper and you're good, they can parachute you in the dark, in the middle of the night, naked, any part of the country. And by noon... The next day, you'll have 500 bucks in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Is that cool? I, I think about that like, wow. Well, how? Go to a truck stop and say, hey, you want your truck lettered? Give me a towel. Cover me up. Give me 100 bucks. For, <laughs> give me 100 bucks for materials. I'll be right back. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's that it's that promising to to people. And how do you do that? That's what my lecture talks about. But it's there, and I think people stop themselves before they get motivated enough to do it. They go, ah, who's going to want me? I'm just a dumb old kick sign painter. You know, I've heard somebody say that to me, and I thought, there's your, there's your stop sign. You can sit there till some rear engine because you're not going any farther with that attitude. <laughs> he found it's that, all he about found, attitude. He found that one red light in your town, man. Is what happened. <laughs> yeah, that's your attitude. It has a lot to do with it, you know, self esteem and self respect. And remember all these hours you put in to get where you are, because nobody's going to credit you that when they ask you how much it costs. They're going to try to get you, beat you down into half what you want, you know. So most of my conversations, uh, to close, you know, you know, the word close the sale means to to nail the deal down. Yeah, I have a hard yeah. time with it. <laughs> I got to watch your yeah. course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of times people say, well, what do you charge? And I always tell them, is that how you bought your car? Did you call the car dealership and say, hey, how much for a car? You didn't buy your car like that. You didn't buy your house like that. You you treat me the same way. Let's get some let's get some facts on the table. I'll be happy to get. But the price is the last thing I talk about. Let me show you what I can do. We'll talk about your budget in a minute. But let me show you what I can do. And. It kind of breaks that tension of money, money, money. You know, you want to whip their up, but you got to give them a taste of that ice cream before you hand them a bill. Like, here, this tastes good. Try this. Oh, yeah, I like that. Okay, here's what it costs. And then you're done. And you don't have to worry about that part. Get it out Get it out on the table. But you guys have so much trouble with that. They're scared. They're, they're in, insecure about their value. And I refer back to all these hours you spend practicing. If you suck, you suck. And nobody's going to make that better. Until you hit the hit the drawing board, but and you know, once you get to a point where you can do a simple uh, dagger design on the front fender, and it takes you ten minutes, that's forty bucks or fifty bucks. Now multiply that times ten on a bike <clears throat> at a second color, you got six hundred bucks in your pocket in an hour and a half. So well, why is that so hard? Well, that's a lot of money. Well, yeah, it is a lot of money. The guy comes to, the guy comes to fix my toilet. Charges a hundred dollars an hour. You know what I get when he leaves? My toilet flushes. I don't feel cool. I don't feel like I'm the man. I just got a toilet that flushes. <laughs> you know, when I leave, you're the man. You're cool. You're gonna go out and brag. And I'm only I'm only twice as much. So isn't that worth it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, for, where uh where where can people where do people go to find your academy? I'm on Facebook under Steve Chazaka Graphics Academy, <clears throat> and uh, I got pages on Facebook, a couple pages, but uh, um, I'm always dropping the, the hint and link about how to get to it. But uh, my, my students do most of the talking for me because I've had nobody ever ask for their money back. And I give a money back guarantee if you don't like it. But everybody that's taken it so far is like, man, this is awesome. They love it. Because it's slow, it's six months. You can't rush ahead. You got to take the full six months. But I kind of, I kind of hint that after six months, if you've never touched a brush, after six months, you better be worth fifty bucks an hour. And in a year, you better be worth a hundred an hour. 
or I've done, not done my job. And in five years, you better be worth 200 an hour. So there's, there's that track I lay down for you. And it works for me and it's worked for all my students so far that it's just a system. It's a method. You want to learn how to play the piano? You don't sit down and like I see people get on, on YouTube and go, here, watch me stripe. Okay, now you can do it. I'm thinking you haven't taught him anything. You're showing I saw all my YouTube videos are showing off. I'm not teaching anything. But to to learn how to make those strokes, to learn how to hold your breath and hold your hand and how to stand and what to just do with distractions and what to think while you're putting the brush down is what you need to learn. You know, when you pick up a, a a sheet of music for a piano and it's a piece of Chopin you know, 37,000 notes on two pieces of paper and you think you're going to sit down and do that. You don't know where the notes are, where the keys are, where the chords are, where the fingers go. That's what I teach you. The basics. Then I teach you color. And then I teach you attitude. Then I teach you pricing. Then I teach you structure. So it's like a college course. It's not a quick 10 minute YouTube video. And I tell my students, if you've been watching YouTube for five years and you come to me, you're you're gonna have a harder time because you got all these other bad habits you gotta break now. So, you know, I'm kind of stodgy about that. I want people to get it right the first time and not get frustrated because they want to go back to their old bad habits. There's a lot of bad habits. You see you see you see stuff that people post, and again everybody's like, Oh, it's so good, man, you're the bomb, you're dope. <laughs> I want it right on there. No, you're not. Yeah, don't let that eat. I got don't let that get in your way. I got videos out there from when I first started two years in. So probably ninety percent of your business is coming from me. <laughs> I'm saying from the bad videos that I put out. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, you know, we made we made most of our living on the road because this town where I live, within twenty miles, believe it or not, there are five killer stripers, and they're good. They're all good. And one's my son-in-law. Airbrush, he's amazing. Uh, so I, I just left town. I would start going to rallies, and man, you know, three, four, five thousand dollars a day take home. Now, that's not a brag. You know, my best day at a rally ever was nine thousand dollars in 14 hours. Wow. wow. And so when I teach, I'm coming from that perspective. I'll show you how to do that. I'll, I'll teach you how to do that. Not nine thousand dollars a day, but thousand bucks a day. On standing on your hands, go to a bike night, go to a cruise in, hold yourself a certain way, show your, your, your material a certain way and carry yourself a certain way. You'll get the money. They'll, they'll be begging for you because you're good. If you ain't good, don't, don't talk to me. Don't, you know, don't, what can, what can you do? Cause you're not good. Go get good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll show you how to get good, but then I'll show you how to make money at it. So it's a really, a, but I, I'm so happy that I put these courses on online because i see people struggle new guys come on all the time on facebook hey i'm just getting started what do i do and everybody's like go look at youtube videos Ooh, <laughs> go buy the starter kit from mac and practice 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 you know i will practice what yeah we're supposed to practice bad habits you know so anyway i, I, I sound opinionated but i am i'm gonna have a big opinion about that and it's been successful well, you got a you so, got a lot of experience, so you you, should, you know, uh, yeah. Your opinion, well, sure. your opinion is uh is you know it should matter, uh, especially in this art form. And uh, you've seen a lot of people come and go. You've seen a lot of you know folks doing it the right way, the wrong way. So I think uh, I think your opinion is very valid. Um, I, go ahead. I appreciate that, and I'll tell you when I see you know the Lindenburgers and the Kafkas and the. Uh, Alan Johnson's and the Wise Gerbers and all these guys that are respected, you have to step back and say, you can't, like or Hanson, you can't say, oh, that style sucks. That ain't, I don't do it that way. It's not, it's not your place. These people have established themselves and have earned the same respect that you want because it's a different look. You know, it's theirs. They can, they can claim title because they've developed, Dwayne, they've developed that that look and it's uniquely there. There's only a handful of guys that can say that a handful, a dozen or so. The rest of us are just copying what they do and trying to improve upon it. So, you know, show respect to those guys that have been out there 50 years 
and learn from them because no matter how they look, they may be all tattooed up and have purple hair or like me, not a mark on them and look like an old fart. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's what they, it's what they're bringing that you want to look at. It's all visual. And if you can get, if you can get to the point, like where, where you guys are, if you get to that point where you're comfortable and inventive, uh, Man, you're passed us up. I told I told Jen that. I said, you're, you've passed us up. You, you've, you've made a mark at an early age. Good for you. I'm not ashamed to say that. Yeah, Jen's a monster. Jen's just, yeah. yeah she's, there's a lot she's of you guys. There's there. a lot of you guys that we old timers should be taking a look at and saying, man, I wish I was 40 years younger and good as they were. Because imagine what we'd be doing today. You know, how, mu- how much farther are you guys going to take it than our generation? We'd had nothing to start with. You guys have this advantage of all this information and sharing, you know, that's going on. If you can get past the egos and the and the uh, snide comments that some people make sometimes, that'll crush a guy. You know, somebody says, oh, that sucks. That's not, it might. It might. But you think it's good. You know, keep in there and keep staying with it because, man, it's there. Yeah, I think I think uh, I think Jack and I are kind of. Uh, in the mindset of looking to see where it might go in the realm of just art, you know, uh, and and uh, with the Butler uh, exhibit being a, a kind of a beacon of where that could lead to. So, yeah. you know, I, I know personally, I, I still do this part time. I, I, I work a, a nine to five job and mm-hmm. uh, I enjoy creating the art just for art's sake and mm-hmm. and uh i don't mind it i actually like having both the both the you know i like my job and i like doing this on yeah. the side yeah. so um, i think we're we're kind of looking forward at a different angle because uh you know because of folks uh, that have laid the foundation in the past and have uh, uh now you know we're kind of trying to see it from a different way um, i know jack still does a lot of vehicles i'm kind of going back to doing some vehicles cuz i took a break I felt like I jumped in too quick, um, but we're trying to see where we can guide our way through in a different way. That's a great uh, approach because it is an art form. It's, it's you know people try to ca- categorize it to toll painting or hobby stuff. You know, like these people that paint on barn slates and mailboxes. But there was an artist down the street from me, and he was a great oil painter. In fact, he won the National Park Stamp Award a few years ago and won a big cash prize. And, and he, he thought he could learn to pinstripe. And I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll come to your studio and you teach me how to oil paint. And then you come here and I'll teach you how to pinstripe. He had some talent. He's got some huge. Well, this lasted about three months. I tried and tried and tried. and could not get to first base. He tried and tried and tried to pinstripe. And he couldn't make it at all. With his huge talent, he just couldn't get the hang of this. So as far as an art form, I have a huge respect for what you guys are doing as far as making it more and more beautiful with the backgrounds and the, and the inventive processes and the, just the auto. I told uh, George Brooks about your style. I said, Freddie has a shotgun approach, man. It hits and just goes <laughs> everywhere where I'm kind of confined to a little couple grooves here and I swing over here. I don't get too crazy. Freddie, look at Freddie, man. He's off to, he's out of control. And I appreciate that. I'm not condemning it or critic. I appreciate that. How you feel about the brush and the amount of color you use and the and the, the direction you take it. And and the same with Jack. And the same with Jen. And the same with I could name a thousand of them. They are in a, 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 a kind of a mindset. And they and they don't get out of it. it stays it stays their style. And it's recognize once it gets recognizable, that's that's a real milestone. So I can look at Freddie's stuff. I can look at you know uh what's he call himself from Tennessee, I forget. Friend uh, of Anthony Spaz. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I look at that stuff and I go, Man, unreal. And I had a hard time picking those guys for that Butler exhibition because uh, Peter Meyer, who asked, who asked me to put that show on, he said, get the top 100 guys in the country. I said, Peter, there isn't a top 100 guys. I can think of about 40. I don't know everybody, but I had a hard time coming up with enough good talent to be 
fine art. Sorry about the truck school. I'm walking outside. I had a hard time finding guys that hit that caliber of presentation. Not everybody can do that and do it consistently. So when it when these pieces started rolling in here, I was just absolutely stunned at what these guys came up with. And the show was such a huge success that they held it over three times. They extended it. So I, I, I count that a huge success. It's art that people can look at and go, I know what that is. You, know, you go to a gallery and you go, oh, what's this guy thinking? What's the artist trying to interpret? <laughs> you know, who cares? You look at this stuff and it's like, yeah, that's cool. That's Americana. You know, we invented this. So that's pretty, that's pretty proud to be part of that fraternity, you know, uh, when you get that far along. And, and, I, and I try to encourage guys to get to that point. It might take 10 years, five years, but there's people there in that short amount of time that are doing it. So yeah. that's cool. Yeah. Uh, Jack and I were uh, definitely surprised and very honored to be uh, chosen to be a part of that. And we're still kind of, I'm still buzzing off of it. And I, uh, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm wanting to go back and do another panel jam here soon. I uh, just, you know, uh, time restraints and, and whatnot. But that was my first time pinstriping around other pinstripers. Um, oh. Yeah, and you're like, oh, let's just do it. Let's just do a panel together. I'm like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, and you're like, just grab the brush, man. I'm like, uh. <laughs> uh that exhibition, incidentally, is going finally to uh, – Salina, Kansas, to the K Custom Kemps of America Museum, and then and then on to uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, the Speedway. But uh, we've had some glitches in getting there. Of course, gas doubled. Uh, and the, is there a is there a date yet for the Salina, Kansas? I guess well, it was, should have been there a month or two ago. But first, they, that's a long story. First, they wanted it, then they couldn't take it, and then they wanted to put it in the storage barn. Yeah, bring that. We'll stick it in a barn. I go, no way. I'm not bringing all this art. Yeah. Let it's in some barn with rats. Who knows where it's going to be in there. Even if it's a storage facility, no thanks. So I held on to it until they could take it. And then my driver fell through and my other driver fell through. So now it's Artie and I are going to haul it out there. You know, a huge expense. But we want, we want to keep it, keep the wheels under it, you know. So and hopefully it'll end up in, uh, in, uh, in Los Angeles at the uh, Patterson Peterson. That'd be amazing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Jay Leno's going to lay, lay his eyes on it in Kansas if we get it out there in time. Um, my goal really was to have him buy the whole thing and then give everybody some money, you know, split it up. But uh, we'll see if he sees it and likes it. I'm going to do a panel to give to him as a as a token of just here. Check this out. Take a take a second look at this stuff. And if he says, "Man, that would look good hanging in my shop," now nah, we'll talk. <laughs> But I dream big. Yeah, you know, I, I go for the stars, so it'll probably never happen. But why not? <laughs> you know. <laughs> so yeah, it's heading out there pretty soon. We're taking out next week or two. Wow, we're excited to be a part of it. Um, yeah. Well, I wanted. I was going to say we're about a little bit over an hour. Uh, I wanted to see if Jack has any uh, last questions, or I know I got something that I want to ask, but I'll I'll toss it over to Jack real fast. Sure. Yeah, I, I my interest has peaked on something a little bit. You said that uh, before you really got started going full time with this, that you were working, doing art. Uh, what was it exactly that you were doing that? Um, interesting. I was selling insurance in real estate and doing this on the side. And one of my customers, one of my insurance customers, was a an architectural illustrator, and he opened up a bicycle. Uh, parts warehouse, uh, Arnie Nashbar, Bike Nashbar, he called it. And he put himself through college pinstriping and he, and he was terrible at it. <laughs> he, knew how, he knew how hard it was to do. And when he saw my work, he offered me a job as an illustrator. I said, I don't know anything about that, Arnie. I can't do that. No, I know you could do it. I said, how do you know I could do it? He goes, I've seen your pinstriping. You can do this. I can teach you how to do this in 10 minutes. Nah, yeah, I didn't have no confidence. I didn't have any idea I could do it. Well, he rode me for about eight months, and I finally relinquished or relented and said, okay, all right, I'll, I'll take the job. And, uh, of course, he gave me a nice salary and everything, and I worked there uh, as doing illustrations of, of bicycle parts. You take a picture of it, put a tissue over it, and do a tracing, and then show oh, okay. it. It was just junk. So, yeah, so that's how I got started is, is – uh, 
was a, I'm wiggling them two fingers again, artist and a mail order company, but uh, it was great. It was a great opportunity. I thank him to this day for the opportunity he gave me to be a real artist, you know? Well, I know uh, a lot of us have seen your cartoon car- caricature kind of looking stuff too. Well, you just broke up real yeah, bad. You're, you're breaking up, uh, Jack. Uh oh, we might have lost him. Yeah, Jack. Jack, you're breaking up like crazy, man. Uh, maybe if you could step around or step outside or something. Ground control to me. Now, yeah, here we, we go. Got yeah, you back. yeah, we got you back. Okay. <laughs> now, what what I was wondering is the uh, cartoons and caricatures and whatnot that you do. Has that ever been? something that you've done professionally or is that just kind of a, a hobby sort of deal or uh it's a knack i have and uh, actually 40 years ago i tried to become a syndicated cartoonist i, I developed a cart a comic strip i went to new york uh, for a three a three-day seminar on how to get syndicated and uh talked to mort walker and some of these big name artists and uh came home and worked a year on a comic strip and fell on my face. It was just not funny. I'm not a funny guy. And I, I, even though I could draw as good as some of those that were already syndicated, you have to have a topical political, um, you know, women's rights and racial issues and holiday issues. And you got to address all those in a funny way. I'm not funny. So uh, it was like a crash and burn, but that was a great experience. I still love doing, you know, funny little drawings, but uh, there's no money in it for me. Right. Yeah. I wish I could, but it never happened. And yeah, I remember. Say, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just, I remember whenever we were there at your shop and seeing, I think there was like a clock or something that had a bunch of little <laughs> cartoons on it and stuff. I yeah. thought it was really neat. It's just really fascinating. Yeah, it is. It's so cool. I, I'm constantly, I have books and books full of, uh, compilations like that just fantasy stuff that doesn't belong together uh, you know I, I was thinking yesterday about there's two types of art there's that which exists meaning if you want to paint a picture of an old gas station with a car in front of it and some gas pumps that that exists you're you're, you're duplicating that with your style and then there's that which you imagine so i draw i imagine a lot of this stuff that what if i did this what if i had a guy with an elephant trunk Big feet and you know that kind of stuff, <laughs> and so I, ima- I have a great imagination with with bizarre stuff. People look at it and go, "What's wrong with you?" <laughs> you <know>? <laughs> <laughs> and I like that. <laughs> I always tell them, "They go, where do you come up with all these crazy monsters?" So, well, they live up in my. I tap myself on the forehead. Said they live up here, and I have to let them out once in a while because it gets noisy. <laughs> Well, has that ever spilled over into our, I guess, does it help you with any of the creativity with striping or anything? Do you see that there's any? Uh, I'll tell you what I see. I'll tell you what I see in this uh, field of pinstriping. I see a lot of rat finks, flying eyeballs, Frankensteins, tiki's, uh, you know, been there, done that stuff that uh, people uh, feel that they have to, obligatory, they have to draw a rat fink in order for this piece to sell. And the buying public agrees. So yeah, I really, I don't dis, dislike or discard or, or disrespect that they do that. But I'm in another world as far as creativity. I can develop and, and draw. Like if people say, hey, I call my car uh, the big kahuna. And I'll draw a little fat Hawaiian guy with a grass skirt. And ne- they've never seen anything. <laughs> I don't do a tiki. I'll do a I'll do a cartoon of a guy. So that's been an edge for me to be able to develop characters like that occasionally. But it's not, you know, people still want Tweety Bird and Taz and all that stuff too. So you got to kind of, you know, Yosemite Sam. That kind of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> that's been done. I'm just copying somebody else's art. I I do remember looking on the wall and seeing um, it was like a, it was like a fish bird dragon thing that's multicolored and i remember staring at it thinking oh i'm gonna ask him if i could buy it <laughs> i'm afraid to see i'm afraid to see but i'm gonna ask him and i remember asking you and you're like oh yeah point it out and i pointed it out to you and you said nope that's a part of the permanent collection 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know which one you're talking about, but thanks for offering. Oh my god, <laughs> it was. I mean, I just, I even asked my lady. I'm like, look, uh, we might have to sell a kidney or something, but I kind of really want that thing. And uh, she's like, well, ask him. I was like, all right, but um, I saw, I see where uh, why it would have been. It's just, it was beautiful. Um, and just all the art you got everywhere, and like you got art wrapped up like like hoagies in the corner of your <laughs> yeah yeah. In, in I'll tell paper. you where that came from. I'll tell you where that came from, Freddie. I had an uncle when I was a kid. I was like six years old. He had this forty uh, one Chrysler Town and Country wood grain station wagon, cool car, and <clears throat> he used to take us for rides in it. Me and my brother. He was one of them greaser, you know, guy with his tur- shirt sleeve rolled up and a, and a flat top haircut and chino pants and pointy shoot cool guy man really cool guy dig boot he did he was into doo-wop and all that stuff nice and he was my hero and on the headliner of his car above where the driver's seat was his buddy took a piece of canvas and painted this skull with bat wings with blood dripping out of the eyes and blood dripping off the claws it was a cr- i still have it his, his son gave it to me crude but horrifying. I, you know, I grew up in 1950. <laughs> I'd never seen anything so bizarre. And it imprinted on me the idea that, well, cool cars, cool guys, sick art. Man, this is the way to go. And I didn't even know what I was thinking at that age. But that's what I look back was my first introduction to this bizarre world of where we live. You know, this crazy world of cool cars and bikes. And you know, look at guys wanting their bikes. You know, death and dragons and skulls. And I thought, man, that's the way to go. That's art, you know. So <laughs> that's kind of where I ended up, you know. Yeah, it's got an edge to it. It really does. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it incites something in that demographic that they enjoy. They want to ha- They want to hear the loud pipes, the screeching tires, you know, and the art that goes with it. This is not and a bloody a, vampire uh, skulls. <laughs> yeah, it's not a Mercedes or a, a BMW. This is a... 40 Ford, you know, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, it's it's uh it's it's rolling art, but it's not uh it's not uh in a in a glass case. It's something that's meant no. to be dirty. Yeah, and they want to see it at the at the drive in and and uh, hang out on it, hang out by that vehicle. Absolutely. Well, yeah. um I did have a couple of questions. Uh one and this has just popped up in my head, so I don't mean to put you on the spot. But sure. is there anybody that you would like to hear on this podcast that uh, you would like to hear some more of their stories? Wow. Uh, yeah, boy, I, that, didn't, I didn't mean to put you on the spot like that, but I just thought, <laughs> I just thought about it. I thought, maybe, who, who would Steve like to hear? Yeah, or uh, uh, one guy that comes to mind is Jim Norris in uh, in Chira, uh, South Carolina. Another guy is. Uh, uh, Russ Mowry, M O W R Y, up in uh, Lynnhurst, New- I think he's in Lynnhurst, New Jersey. D. Wayne Conant and Paul Quinn are, are two of my favorite guys because of their demeanor and their uh, abilities. But I could go on and on. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to just salute all those guys uh, that that kind of set Mr. J. You know, the guys that set the set the pace i guess back then uh of i'm still trying to catch up you know i'm still trying to uh, get in that fraternity and gain the respect of some of these guys that uh are so well revered and renowned and and uh, i just want to you know like when i hear from i get i get likes uh from uh guys that i've I just honored uh noel weber a lettering guy sent me his book for free. Sent me some glass panels he did. Oh, Noel his Weber. work's amazing. Yeah, and he, he says I like what you do. He's very soft spoken, and I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, Drew, I can only know, imagine. Drew, <laughs> Drew Blair. Drew Blair will call me, or give me a like, or give me a comment once in a while, and I think, who? Who? Hello, Drew? Who? You're talking to me? The guys, the guys that are so light years ahead of me. That'll, that'll call and give you a little nod once in a while. It's like, man, I've arrived. I'm so happy to hear from the check. And I try to pass that on too. I'm not one of them, but I, I like the younger and more inexperienced guys to know that we're watching you, man. You guys are kind of scaring us. You're coming on strong. It's really good <laughs> to see. And it's helping us keep pushing to get that little back <laughs> draft of, of uh, don't let up. These guys will run over you. 
that's how a lot of us feel maybe without saying it is that holy cow good as we might be these guys are right on your heels they're 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 overtaking you a lot of them so some it's it's humbling it really is i don't know whoever you ask around because uh i like a lot of the stuff that uh, i see out there and it's kind of put me on the spot because i'd have to research a little bit but the, some of the names i gave you Dwayne and them guys yeah those are good uh, well, yeah we appreciate that you know i didn't want to i didn't want to uh, have you have to pull out the rolodex um but those are good <laughs> well those you are, are old school <laughs> yeah oh i like them. i always thought they were cool man the rolodex um the other thing i was going to ask is do you have any stories like a, a story of something crazy that happened to you at some point or or something uh you know disastrous or something that happened in, in your pinstriping journey that you could think of that uh the listeners might enjoy well this this story takes about five minutes but i was on my way home from a rally in my 52 Chevy sedan delivery. And I was, it was painted bright red at wizard on the side. And I'm pulling my red Coca-Cola with gold leaf letters, trailer, two wheels under this Coke machine trailer made out of fiberglass. And I'm, I'm, I'm cruising home from this rally. And to shorten the story, my, uh, my trailer came loose. There wasn't any safety chains on it. And it came loose from my car. And I look in my rearview mirror, and this thing's doing an endo on Route 70, whatever it was, coming oh, from Indianapolis. And I had two cases, two milk crates full of one shot, another milk crate full of wax and grease remover and uh, reducers, two brush boxes, because my son in laws are with me, and all our luggage in this trailer. And it just split open like a banana and flipping this stuff down the road. And these one shot cans at 70 mile an hour were just throwing rooster tails because the lids won't stay on. They're spraying the guy. In a white T-bird convertible, incidentally, <laughs> behind me, <laughs> bumper to bumper, 70 miles. Out. We're in the middle lane, and it was just like a slick, 100 feet long on a road of rainbow colors, and cars were driving through it. You hear that little shh? You know, <laughs> we stopped, and I'm trying to flag cars out of the lane. It was like, I don't know why we didn't car 100, cause a 100 car pileup, but it was right by an on ramp, and the a cop was just getting on, so he saw the whole thing. So he came out there with flares and stuff, put his lights on, stop traffic and all this stuff. So he says, you can't take this trailer home because it's a it's wrecked. The license plate came off, the lights came off, you know, the fenders were all bent, lid fell off. So we picked up all the paint, stuffed it back in the trailer, hit it. We hit it at this uh, off that ramp that he was on. There was a bunch of weeds next to this old abandoned fireworks place. We stuck it in the weeds and he goes, okay, here's your ticket for 40 bucks for unsafe load. Go home and come back five hour trip. It's going to come back and get the trailer. So <clears throat> he left and we drove up to the next truck stop and I pulled in there and got a new CB antenna, which was on my trailer and drove back to the site of the scene of the crime. And I took a roll of duct tape and I taped the trailer all back together and stuck it on the car. And we we're going to drive it home. The reason I had the CB antenna was in case I heard about a cop up ahead, I would you know ditch off the road real quick so I didn't get pulled over again. Just thinking it might be the same cop that gave me that ticket, right? So Hello. Oh, hello. Uh oh, I think we lost. Oh, I'm sorry. I hit I hit the mute button with my Oh, you scared me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. So we, we drove back up to the truck stop to get some gas, and there's two cop cars sitting there. And I'm sure one of them was uh, one of the cops that gave me the ticket. So I heard him ducked in behind this uh, semi truck so he couldn't see me. We go in there and sit down, and get a cup of coffee. Like, how are we going to get past these cops? They're sitting here. They're sitting here. They won't leave. I say, hey, I know how to get rid of them. So I got up. This is before cell phones. I got up, went to the, the pay phone, I put a dime in. I called 911. I go, hey, do you have a car in the vicinity of. You know, I looked on my ticket and the exit uh, ramp I was on. I go, she goes, yeah. I says, well, we just saw two guys trying to break into that fireworks place. Down. You might want to send a car down there. We just drove by there. And <laughs> we look out the window and the cop throws his hat on and puts his siren and lights on. They both take off that way. And we went the other way and got away. <laughs> so that was, that was one of our advent, one of many adventures we've had on the road. <laughs> My son in law sitting there going, You can't call the cops. That's hey, we've got to get out of here one way. I'm not coming back to this trailer. 
it was so much craziness, you know, in our career. Wow, you but got, yeah, you got him off your tail. You did it. That's right. You know, just it didn't, no, nobody got hurt. No gun, no shots were fired. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but yeah, I really appreciate you guys taking an interest in this and trying to keep some of these uh, these things alive. It's really good. Yeah, you know, the energy to do that. Well, we're we're honored that you were uh, would bless us uh, with your with your stories and your and your knowledge, and we really appreciate your time. Hey, try that on somebody else. Remember what I said. <laughs> we're still right. you know, we're still going to give it out. So we thank you very much, Steve. All right, you guys. Good talking with you. Keep up your awesome work, both of you. It's been an inspiration to all of us as well. All right. Well, thank you, yeah. Steve. Well, you take care and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest you. of your day. All right. I'll see you both. Take care. Thank all you. All right. Have a good one. Bye. All right. So long. All right. Uh, that was Steve Shazaka. Super, super excited to hear from him and absolutely love that last story that he shared with us there. Uh, do you have anything you wanted to say about that, Freddie? Yeah, I feel bad for all them cars that were behind him. <laughs> yeah. He mentioned the white T-Bird. Oh, my God. But yeah, it's the, Steve's been a big uh, big influence on on my pinstriping for sure. Um you know, I I had probably watched his videos, I'd say a hundred times, just to try to figure out one particular move that he has where he goes kind of backwards with the scroll. So yeah, I've seen that dude do the same design many, 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 many times. Um, <laughs> but no, great guy, and we're we're happy that he came on, and we're we're honored to have him, and uh, very humble person. Like we keep running into very very humble people, and. I think the interview went great. I think it was a good time. Yeah. Again, I know I said it during that, but I think it's really interesting too that so far these are people that are in small towns and been making it happen for a long time. That really says a lot. Yeah, I guess like he says, it really goes to show it's all about your mindset and your approach to how you're going to go about doing this business. And, uh, you know, a, a, a He's got courses. So, folks, if you're out there, if you really want to know, you know, check out the courses. I know at some point I do plan on taking them myself. Yeah, I'm actually a lot more interested now after he was talking about uh, the lecture that's in there about the business side of things. That's piques my interest a lot. It, it was always catching my eye, but I think, you know, everybody's like, oh, there's that one thing that's kind of it's pushing you over the edge to do it, you know. Uh, yeah, I just, you know, and then it, it's on your own time too. So it really, it's not even a time restraint thing. Uh, right. But for sure it was, I think it was a great, uh, great interview and, uh, I think it was a good time. Yeah. Well, with that said, um, go ahead and wrap it up here again. We're very thankful to all of you that have been listening. And if you'd like to contact us, you can find us at, uh, or you can email us at pinstripers or excuse me the pinstripers podcast at gmail.com we'd love to hear any suggestions that y'all have um constructive criticism questions you might have that you'd like to see us ask or if you have suggestions of people you want to hear from yes and we also i believe uh, have our own personal social media you could reach uh me at Via pinstriping on Instagram, uh, via pinstriping on Facebook, and uh, Jack, I know you got a little bit of Instagram as well. Yes, it's Jack Fleming Artistry um, on Instagram. There's that on Facebook and on YouTube. It's kind of all over there. We do have a Facebook page, too, for the podcast, the Pinstripers Podcast Facebook page. And Jack, when people go to look for this, it's called The Pinstripers Podcast. The, the word the is in there, correct? Correct. All right. All right. Well, I think that's about enough of the business. And uh, we hope you all tune into the next one. And we're going to try to knock these out as often as we can. Uh, we're aiming for two a month. But again, you know, schedules and such, uh, it, it makes it a little difficult sometimes. But that's what we're going for. Yeah. I guess as most people would say, keep your brushes wet and hope you guys are there for the next one. All right, y'all. Have a good day. All right. Bye. Bye.